welcome and hello everyone today we are going to read the guideline on pre menstrual syndrome so the guideline tells us about the definition of pre menstrual syndrome it says that pms encompasses a vast array of psychological symptoms such as depression anxiety irritability loss of confidence and mood swings there are also physical symptoms like bloatedness and nostalgia it is the timing rather than the type of symptoms and the degree of impact on daily activity that supports the diagnosis of pms the character of symptoms in an individual does not influence the diagnosis in order to differentiate physiological menstrual symptoms from pms it must be demonstrated that symptoms cause significant impairment to the individual during the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle so it it says that it is the timing in the cycle which matters and which defines a premenstrual syndrome there is a very nice diagram regarding the different types of uh, symptoms and the different type the patient may present with different types of symptoms and how we can differentiate uh, within them and how uh, to characterize each and every symptom and how to manage that symptom too okay so i'll make it a little bigger so that you all can see so if a patient presents with a premenstrual symptom what is the next thing the next thing is the patient is given a diary to record the symptoms that the patient is having for at least two consecutive menstrual cycles right after that depending upon the type of symptoms the patient is presenting we categorize them into different types one is if the symptoms are cyclical and are relieved by menstruation they have a symptom free week afterwards they have no influence on quality of life so the symptoms is not are not affecting the quality of life they are related to menstruation and the menstruation happens in this cycle there are no additional factors okay so the curves indicate the the symptoms so the symptoms are there and on the days of menstrual cycle they are going down and then they are again coming back this is physiological or mild premenstrual disorder this is mild because it is not affecting the quality of life and this is physiological so we may say that some type of symptoms that are that are occurring in every women like irritability mood swings which are present before your periods and get relieved when you have periods can be considered physiological unless and until it affects your quality of life the treatment here is counseling and reassurance no other need of treatment let us go forward and see the next one the next one tells about the symptoms which are clinical and they are relieved by menstruation they again have a symptom free week but here there is an effect on quality of life menstruation is present but there are no other additional factors such type of patients are categorized are of having poor premenstrual disorder 
This is also called as premenstrual syndrome or premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Here, consider all the alternative approaches to the treatment. So we need to consider treatment for this patient. So these are the patients we are dealing with this category of patient in this guideline. The next one are the patients who have got symptoms which are cyclical and relieved by menstruation, but there is no symptom free week. So look at the curve there, it is not going down at all, okay? So there is a little relief, but there is no symptom free week. It affects the quality of life, there is menstruation, and there is an existing non-menstrual condition. This is called as premenstrual exacerbation. So when whatever non-menstrual condition that is existing, that condition exacerbates, right? And it remains, these the symptoms remain throughout uh, the month. They don't, they, they can become, they can reduce or they can increase, but they, they are not completely free of symptoms at any point of time. Herein, these patients should have the treatment and the treatment should aid to treat the underlying medical, physical and psychiatric condition and suppress ovulation. If the symptoms are clinical, patient has a symptom free week. It affects the quality of life. There is no menstruation and there is no additional factor. Such patients are categorized as premenstrual disorders with absent menstruation. These are the patients which are treated same as that of four premenstrual disorders. So the only difference here is there is no menstruation. The next category of patients are the symptoms with clinical, uh, are the patients with clinical symptoms and are relieved by menstruation. There is a symptom free week. There is an uh, effect on the quality of life. Patients are having menstruation, but there is a progestogen treatment going on. So such patients are categorized as progestogen induced premenstrual disorders. And herein we need to change the progesterone that we are giving to them okay the last one is patient having non-cyclical symptoms there is no symptom free week they have constant influence on the quality of life so the curve is not coming down at all there is menstruation such patients have got some psychological disorder and they need a psychiatric breath I hope your uh, ideas are very clear with the different types of uh, disorders that you may come across with the same symptoms. Sorry. So let's go ahead. As I've said, there is a classification of PMS and I've explained it later in the guideline as, as with all PMDs, Symptoms must be severe enough to affect the daily functioning or interfere with work, school, and interpersonal relationships. The symptoms of core PMDs are non-specific and recur in ovulatory cycles. They must be present during the luteal phase and abate as menstruation begins, which is then followed by a symptom DB. So that was core PMD. Now, there are different various types of PMDs. We know, uh, we have seen them in the table. So there is premenstrual exacerbation that we have seen are the patients who have got some underlying medical disorder like diabetes, depression, epilepsy, asthma, migraine. These patients will experience symptoms relevant to their disorder throughout the menstrual cycle. There are patients who are non-ovulatory. We have seen them again in the, in the chart. And they occur in the presence of ovarian activity without any ovulation. These uh, patients, they just don't have any ovulation, okay? But they have the symptoms. This is poorly understood due to the lack 
of evidence but it is thought that the follicular activity of the ovary is instigating the symptoms in such patients the next one is the progesterone induced which we just saw and they are caused by exogenous progesterones present in hrt and coc pills so this reintroduces symptoms to women who may per be particularly sensitive to progesterones now remember they are caused only by the progesterones present in hrt and combined oral pills although progesterone only contraceptive may introduce symptoms as they are non cyclical they are not included within the variant tmd and are considered adverse effect of continuous progesterone therapy so only if the progesterone is present in hrt or in oc pills the combined oc pills then we consider it as a progesterone induced pmp if it is because of the progesterone only pill then it is considered as an adverse effect of the progesterone even all the time now pmds with absent menstruation include women who still have functioning ovarian cycle but for the reasons such as hysterectomy endometrial ablation or lng ius that is the myrena they do not menstruate okay so there is an incidence that they have mentioned and it is 4 in 10 women will experience pms so it's very common and around 5 to 8% will suffer from very severe symptoms currently there are two theories which predominate and they appear interlinked so the first one tells us that some women are sensitive to progesterone and progesterone since the serum concentrations of estrogen or progesterone are the same in those with or without pms okay so first thing is these patients are sensitive to progesterone second are the second theory implicates that the neurotransmitters which are serotonin and gaba the serotonin receptors are responsive to estrogen and progesterone and ssris are proven to reduce the pms symptoms so this neurotransmitters are responsible for the symptoms is the second theory the gaba levels are modulated by metabolite of progesterone which is allopregnenolone and in women with pms the allopregnenolone levels are reduced right so they are kind of uh, considering that this neurotransmitter they are also one of the reasons they could also be one of the reasons why patients have problems of some women have more problems of pms okay now the next one is how is pms diagnosed when clinically really re reviewing the women of pms the symptoms should be recorded prospectively over two cycles using a symptom diary as retrospective recall of symptoms is unreliable a symptom diary should be completed by patient prior to commencing treatment so the sentence is very important whenever a patient comes with a sim with symptoms you need not start the treatment at the same time okay you need to give her a diary you have to ask her to write down whatever is going on whatever symptoms she has she has faced uh she is facing for the next two months she needs to write down and depending on that we'll categorize this patient and start the treatment now gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs may be used for 3 months for definitive diagnosis if completed symptom diary alone is inconclusive so it is not giving any uh, 
any conclusion that this patient is having PMS or not, in which case you may just stop all the action of uh, the ovary by giving GnRH uh, analogs, and then you can find out whether the patient still has symptoms. Okay. So the symptom diaries can sometimes be confusing and inconclusive. This is most likely to occur in those patients with variant PMDs. GnRH analogs, which are widely used within gynecology, can be useful in separating those with and those without PMS by inhibiting the cyclical ovarian function. This should be used for three months to establish a definitive diagnosis. So the first month will allow for the uh, allow the antagonist to generate complete hormonal suppressive effect, and from the second month we can consider all the symptoms for the next two months, right? That is why analogs are given for three months. The first month for the analogs to act and from the, for the, ne the next two months for the symptoms to give us an idea of what is happening. So this is specifically related to the NHS because patients there come to the GPs and when the pa patients are can, could not be handled by GPs or there's something which is a little high risk, they are referred to the hospitals. So when the patients needs to be referred to the hospital, the guideline tells that referral to the gynecologist should be considered when simple measures, which are the combined occipals, vitamin B6, SSRIs, have been explored and failed and when the severity of pms justifies gynecological intervention general practitioners will manage the majority of cases of pms therefore awareness of the condition together with up-to-date information on its management is essential who are the key health professionals to manage the women with severe pms now, this is managed with, by a multidisciplinary team. Severe PMS, of course, will consider, uh, will have a patient who has got emotional problems, physical problems, right? So there is going to be all the factors involved there. They are handled by multidisciplinary team, which involves general practitioners, general gynecologists, or a gynecologist with special interest in PMS and a mental health professional. So the mental health professional could be a psychiatrist, clinical psychologist, or a counselor, and a dietitian. The multidisciplinary team can offer women an individualized management plan, utilizing a range of treatments such as cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy and lifestyle interventions. Okay, so consider the multidisciplinary team involve the mental health professionals, involve the dietitians, again, in treating severe pain. Now, again, we know that there is a lot going about the complementary therapies and its efficacy in treating PMS. The guideline says that women with PMS should be informed that there is conflicting evidence to support the use of some complementary medicines. An integrated holistic approach should be used when treating women with PMS. The interactions with conventional medicines should be considered, and then there they show us a chart there wherein they have said that some of them are useful while some of them are not. So the chart specifically tells us about vitamin B6, which gives mixed results. But remember, it will cause peripheral neuropathy in high doses. Okay, so that is why restrict the daily dose of vitamin B6 to 10 milligrams. The next one is magnesium again, which gives mixed results. Calcium and vitamin D have shown benefits. So the chart is about benefit, the second one. The table tells us that calcium and vitamin D have shown to have benefit in PMS. Isoflavins again have got mixed results, okay, and but they may benefit the migraine specifically, the menstrual migraine. 
now white is agnus castus yes it again has got it again has got shown it again has shown benefits sorry for that in treating patients with pms it can be used st john's wort again shows mixed results so remember about st john's wort that this specifically has got an interaction with conventional medicines and you need to avoid them specifically with ssris again they have also shown to reduce the efficacy of combined oc pills so remember these things with st john's wort they have again said that saffron has shown to have benefit in pms as well as the evening primrose oil has got some benefit in patients who have got nostalgia the cyclical nostalgia okay so considering this chart we can say that calcium and vitamin d white is agnus castus and saffron they have definitive benefit in pms while others have mixed results now they asked whether there is any role of cbt that is cognitive behavioral therapy and other psychological counseling techniques so when treating women with severe pms cbt should be considered routinely as a treatment option so consider cbt routinely every time in patients with severe pms and that is why we have said we need to involve the mental health professional there which osipil combined osipil has best evidence of managing pms including the regimens delivering ethanol estradiol so the answer is when treatment when treating women with pms the drosperinon containing osipils may represent effective treatment for pms and should be considered as first line pharmaceutical intervention this drosperinone has got antimandrelicol corticoid and antiandrogenic properties so it reduces the side effects drosperinone 3 mg with ethanol estradiol can be given for 3 months together the oral contraceptive is now available on nhs in uk it is licensed in europe and usa for pmdd but only in women who require oral contraception okay so remember every word there is important the next one is about the optimum osipil regimen which one is good continuous cyclical flexible so when treating women with pms the emerging data suggests that the contraceptive pills should be used continuously rather than cyclically mood headache and pelvic scores pelvic pain scores are improved so they have said that rather you need to use the extended method right so there is extended use of osipils which has shown more benefits in Uh, specifically in treating patients with pms so you, you may use them for 3 months continuously rather than the 217 or 244 uh, uh type of the the methods that we use so how efficacious is percutaneous estradiol percutaneous estradiol combined with cyclical progesterone has been shown to be effective for the management of physical and psychological symptoms of severe pms when treating women with pms alternative barrier or intrauterine methods of contraception should be considered when estradiol is used to suppress ovulation so remember this is a very important sentence that whenever you are using an estradiol you need to use another methods of of contraception 100 micrograms of estradiol patches twice weekly were as effective as 200 micrograms in reducing the symptom levels in severe pms and that is why 100 microgram estradiol patches are used for treatment although the doses are usually sufficient to suppress the ovulation 
contraceptive efficacy has not been demonstrated and so should not be relied upon additional contraceptive measures should be adopted it is also important to ensure appropriate endometrial protection specifically when you are giving estradiol so remember these two points one is you need to give uh, extra uh, contraceptive to this patient so extra precaution uh, for uh, the sake of contraception and second thing is again you have to protect the endometrium because you are continuously giving estradiol so remember these two safety points here how can the return of tms be avoided during estrogen therapy with progesterone protection when using transdermal estrogen to treat women with tms the lowest possible dose of progesterone and progesterone is recommended to minimize progesterone adverse effects women should be informed that low levels of levonorgestrel released by lng ius 52 can initially produce the pms type adverse effect as well as bleeding problems so remember whenever you are giving the transdermal estrogen you may use the lng ius as the progesterone uh, factor there but it may give little pms like adverse effect in the start micronized progesterone is theoretically less likely to reintroduce the pms like symptoms and should therefore be considered as first line for progesterogenic opposition rather than the progesterones so remember that if uh, in a question they give you the uh, answer as lng ius as well as they write micronized progesterone you you better be quicking be ticking micronized progesterone because that is the first line for as for the the progesterogenic opposition there use of continuous estradiol necessitates the addition of cyclical progesterone and progesterone that is 10 to 12 days of cycle to avoid endometrial hyperplasia intrauterine administration of progesterone has potential to avoid systemic absorption and hence minimize the progesterogenic effect LNG IUS 52 mg as progesterone replacement can maximize efficacy by minimizing the PMS like adverse effects. Low systemic levels of LNG released by LNG IUS can initially produce PMS like adverse effects in progesterone for intolerant women and on rare occasions it will need to be removed due to persisting adverse effect. Micronized oral progesterone has fewer androgenic and unwanted adverse effect compared with the progesterones such as norethisterone and, and levonorgestrel progesterone may act as a diuretic and central nervous system anxiolytic so in theory could alleviate the pms symptoms although there is currently little evidence to demonstrate this micronized progesterone can also be administered vaginally which may be better to tolerate Uh, by avoiding the first pass hepatic metabolism vaginally administered progesterone avoids the formation of psychoactive metabolites such as allopregnanolol okay so it it completely tells us that micronized oral progesterone is better what is the optimum regimen for prevention of endometrial hyperplasia when treating women with percutaneous estradiol a cyclical 10 to 12 day course of oral or vaginal progesterone or long term progesterone with lng ius should be used for prevention of endometrial hyperplasia when using short duration of progesterone or in cases where there are low doses are tolerated there should be low threshold for investigating unscheduled bleeding okay so remember that you need to give some opposition all the time what is the safety study all on premenopausal endometrium and breast tissue when treating women with pms using estradiol women should be informed that there is insufficient data to advise on long term effects on breast and endometrial tissue so you don't know the effect of estradiol on breast and endometrial tissue on a long term for how long the estradiol can be used safely what is the risk of recurrence due to uncertainty of the long term effects of opposed 
of a post-estradiol therapy. Treatment of women with PMS should be an individual basis, taking into account the risks and benefits. So even there, uh, we don't know much about that. What is the evidence for efficacy and adverse effects of Danazol in the treatment of PMS? So women who with PMS should be advised that although the treatment with low dose of Danazol, that is 200 milligrams twice daily, is effective, in the luteal phase for breast symptoms, it also has potential irreversible virilizing effects. Women treated with Danazol for PMS should be advised to use contraception during treatment due to its potential virilizing effects on female fetuses, right? So Danazol therapy does have some adverse effects. It may interfere with the usual symptom-free late follicular phase of women with PMS. These symptoms, which uh, are which are considered as side effects, include acne, weight gain, hirsutism, and deepening of voice. Danazol taken during pregnancy is known to cause clitoral megaly, labial fusion, neurogenital sinus abnormalities in female fetuses, that is, virilization of the female fetuses. These abnormalities occur more frequently with higher doses, however, have been reported at 200 milligrams daily too. So though they consider Danazol uh, in very low doses for, for some patients with PMS, with severe PMS, you have to consider these adverse effects before giving Danazol to any patient. How effective are GnRH analogs for treating patients with severe PMS? So GnRH analogs are highly effective in treating severe PMS. When Treating women with PMS, GnRH analogs should usually be reserved for women with more severe symptoms and not recommended routinely unless they are being used to aid the diagnosis and treat particularly severe cases. So remember, they are used only for the sake of diagnosis and only in severe cases, not routine. How should women with PMS receive ADVAC therapy uh, when they are on GnRH analogs, right? So when treating women with severe PMS using GnRH analogs for more than six months, ADVAC hormone therapy should be used, of course, to avoid the side effects. When ADVAC hormone therapy is required, continuous combined HRT or fibulone is recommended. When women, uh, women should be provided with general advice regarding the effects of exercise, diet, and smoking on the bone mineral density because it directly affects the bone mineral density. Women on long-term treatment should have the measurements of bone mineral density, ideally dual energy X-ray absorption metry, that is DEXA, every year, okay? Treatment should be stopped if bone density declines significantly. So this is specifically about the chain RH analogs. As the symptoms return with the onset of ovarian function, therapy may have to be continued indefinitely. So GnRH alone is precluded by significant trabecular bone loss, which can occur with only six months of treatment. So there is uh, the bone loss starts with six months of treatment. It should be noted that GnRH analogs are only licensed for use for six months when used alone and are not licensed to treat PMS. So remember this thing, they are not licensed to treat PMS and they are only licensed to use only for six months. A high BMI is particularly associated with increased likelihood of osteoporotic fractures and upper arm fractures. A low BMI is linked with hip fractures. DEXA is accepted as gold standard investigation for assessing BMI. DEXA scans every year are considered useful as less frequent scans would delay the diagnosis of significant bone loss and subsequent review of GnRH and log treatment. And a more frequent scan may not be not perceive the small changes. The NICE guideline recommends DEXA scan frequency every two years. Okay, so they NICE guideline generally uh, is more concerned about the resources. So they uh, say that they the frequency should be around two years. However, this is largely based on monitoring the natural menopause and may not apply in this unique situation. So, so uh, for the menopause sake, wherever uh, the uh, the GnRH analogs. Uh, uh, whenever uh, we need to see the PMT in, in cases of patients with menopause, we need to do it every two years. Whereas whenever we are using the GnRH analogs uh, for, and they are uh, 
causing the stopping of the periods and giving the menopausal like symptoms therein we need to see the bmd effect of uh, the genealogy and logs on bmd we need to do it every year so that is the difference so two years for a menopausal women and every one year we for genealogy and logs or a patient with patients with pms can genealogy and logs be useful in clarification of diagnostic category when diagnosis of pms is unclear for two months prospective drsp charting that uh, genealogy analogs can be used so this charting is actually a questionnaire which is given to the patients they have to take the boxes there the genealogy analogs can be used to establish and support the diagnosis of pms although not licensed for this indication genealogy analogs are widely used as diagnostic tool there is currently no evidence to support their use in pms diagnostically but extrapolating from evidence available for treatment of pms the genealogy analog seems a logical option so they they just can be used for the diagnosis okay remember that what is the role of progesterone and progestogen preparations in treating the pms there is a good evidence to suggest that treating pms with progesterone and progestogen is not appropriate there is no evidence to support the use of lng ius alone to treat pms like symptoms the, its role should be confirmed to opposition the action of estrogen therapy on the endometrium so of course the progesterone and progestogens are the ones which which are responsible for causing the pms and they cannot be used for treatment of pms although non hormonal medical management of pms what are they so uh, how do selective ssris work in pms and how should they be given so remember the ssris uh should be considered as one of the first line pharmaceutical management options in severe pms what is the efficacy of them so when treating women with pms the either the luteal or continuous dosing of ssris are recommended women with pms should be shown to have low concentrations of serotonin within the platelets and these varies throughout the menstrual cycle the exact mode of action of ssri is unknown however both estrogen and progesterone have the ability to regulate the number of serotonin receptors and i think we saw this in the very first or second slide okay so this is how the ssris are useful specifically in the psychological symptoms of uh, patients with pms when evaluating the continuous dosing versus luteal dosing there is no significant difference between the ssri regimes so you may either use continuously or you may use them in the luteal phase but SSRIs appear to be effective for both physical as well as psychological symptoms. There are also data supporting the use of SNRIs, serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors for PMT. Okay, so you may I use SNRIs too, but but the recommended are SSRIs. Is there evidence on how SSRIs should be discontinued? so ssri should be discontinued gradually so you may either use them continuously you may use them in the luteal phase so that doesn't make a difference in pms but remember to stop them gradually to avoid the withdrawal symptoms if given on a continuous basis the gastrointestinal disturbances headache anxiety dizziness paresthesia sleep disturbances fatigue influenza like symptoms and sweating are the most common features of abrupt withdrawal of ssris or marked reduction of dose the dose should be tapered over a few weeks to avoid the side effects so remember to taper the dose first and then stop ssri what are the risks and adverse effects of ssri women with pmi pms treated with ssri should be warned of the possible adverse effects like nausea insomnia somnolence fatigue and reduction of libido is there evidence for improved efficacy with other ssri regimens when using ssri to treat pms efficacy may be improved or and adverse effects minimized by use of luteal phase regimens with the newer agents so they say that uh, if you use ssri in the luteal phase efficacy may be improved with the newer agents okay but they have not not uh, really gone very deep into this other type of ssris regimen when preconception 
sorry what preconception and early pregnancy advice should be given regarding ssri and snri women should be provided with pre pregnancy counseling at every opportunity they should be informed that pms symptoms will abate during pregnancy and ssri should therefore be discontinued prior to or during pregnancy women should be informed how safe how to safely stop ssri we just saw women with pms who become pregnant while taking ssri or snri should be aware of the possible although unproven association with congenital malformations so ssri are associated with the congenital abnormalities if taken in pregnancy they should be reassured that if such an association does exist it is likely to be extremely small when compared to the general population so very little effect but it it may be there what women taking luteal phase ssri can discontinue the medication safely at any time whereas women using continuous regimen should taper the dose over the period of time okay so remember if you are giving ssri only in the luteal phase to any patients she may stop it or she may discontinue the medication safely at any time but if you are giving them for throughout the month you need to taper it first and only then stop as advised by doctors they have said that the birth defect may be associated with the ssri or snri in pregnancy and uh, the results are conflicting however many have reported cardiovascular birth defects and the other congenital defects so what are the defects that can occur with ssri or snri are the cardiovascular problems analepsia cystic kidneys cleft foot gastroschisis hypospadia limb reduction and omphalocele there is again uh, uh there they want to ask whether the diuretics are efficacious in treatment of pms because uh they also sometimes uh, sometimes uh, they were shown to have some effect so the spironolactone can be used in women with pms to treat the physical symptoms okay so they have uh, mentioned that it may be used but only for the physical symptoms can surgical management of pms be justified and is it efficacious so when treating women with severe pms hysterectomy and bilateral oophorectomy has been shown to be of benefit when treating women with pms hysterectomy and bilateral oophorectomy can be considered with medical management when the medical management has failed so remember it's not the first line of course uh whenever the medical uh, management has failed the long term gnrh analog treatment is required or other gynecological conditions will are indicating a surgery only then go for hysterectomy or oophorectomy so the indications are very clear should the efficacy of surgery always be predicted by prior use of gnrh analogs when treating women with pms surgery should not be contemplated without pre operative use of gnrh analogs as a test of care and to ensure that hrt is tolerated what is the role of so remember this thing that uh the efficacy should uh, needs to be seen so when before going for surgery you should always find out uh, how the patient is reacting to the hrt because the patients are going to require hrt of course because of sudden uh, uh, sudden menopausal symptoms that which, which may be occurring very very frequently in patients and we need to see that hrt is not bringing back the same same symptoms right so we always need to check and come to check before going for uh, hysterectomy and oophorectomy what is the role of hrt after surgical management women being surgically treated for pms should be advised to use hrt particularly if they are younger than 45 years is there a role of endometrial ablation oophorectomy or hysterectomy alone so when treating women with <coughs> severe pms endometrial ablation and hysterectomy with conservation of ovaries are not recommended of course the ovaries are the culprits bilateral oophorectomy alone will necessitate the use of progestogen as a part of subsequent hrt regimen and this carries the risk of reintroduction of the pms by symptoms so if we only remove the ovaries then there is the endometrium which is always there and we need if we only give on uh, keep on giving estradiol which is going to be required then the hrt is also going to require the progesterone to protect the endometrium so remember that part also so 
uh, always weigh your risks and benefits before going for any treatment. So that that is uh, the whole guideline about. And the guideline gives us a very beautiful chart about the first, second, and third line treatments uh, of how to go ahead with the PMS, and it will be useful in your clinical practice too. So the first line we have seen will involve exercise, cognitive behavioral therapy, vitamin B6, combined new generation pills, maybe cyclical or continuously, continuous or luteal phase, low dose of SSRI, citalopram, acetalopram of 10 milligrams. Okay. So when these are not, uh, the, the things don't go well with the first one. The second line involves estradiol patches of 100 micrograms with micronized progesterone uh, that we have seen or LNG IUS for the, the progesterone opposition. You may use higher doses of SSRIs continuously or luteal phase around 20 to 40 milligrams in the second line of management. Third line will involve the GNRH analogs with an ADBAC therapy, uh, ADBAC therapy, uh, HRT. It will involve continuous combined estrogen plus progesterone. That is around 50 to 100 micrograms of estradiol patches or two to four doses of estradiol gel combined with micronized progesterone or tibolone. So even tibolone can be used for uh, the ADBAC. And it is given in around 2.5 milligrams of use. The last one is, of course, surgical treatment with or without HRT. And we have seen that HRT is 100% required in women less than 45 years of age. So that's the 